Welcome, Arel. Thanks for having me, Cara. How are you? Thank you. I'm so good. Um, this is our very first Zoom webinar, and we're really excited. I can see everybody logging in. Numbers are going up, so that's great. Uh, so welcome, everyone, if you're just joining us. We're here today with Phillips, specifically Arel, the senior consultant who has had one of the most, I will say, electrifying careers in the watch industry, especially when, when it comes to auction. Um, we have something in common, Arel, that I don't think we've ever really talked about as we both worked with Darren Schnipper <laughs> in the beginning of our career. So shout out to Darren. Um, but yeah, so Arel has been from Christie's to Phillips. He, he single-handedly opened up the Phillips watch department and has sold so many records, including the Paul Newman, the Steel 1518, which we'll get to later. Um, he, you know, dramatically re-entered the watch industry when he was bidding on the super complication, which is a watch dear to my heart. Um, and yeah, now he is back with the very first auction uh, in the watch industry for 2020 in a post-COVID, well, not really post-COVID, we're still in it, but in the new normal um, that we are in. So welcome, Arel. Are you excited for your upcoming auction? Well, thanks, uh, Cara. I'm very pleased, by the way, that you gave a shout out to Darren Schnipper. She taught me how to work, um, how to stay late to meet deadlines. So I'm very grateful to Darren and I'm glad that you uh, paid uh, tribute to her as a great mentor. Um, it is in fact the first live auction in watches as far as I know in 2020. Uh, the last time in December in New York for Game Changer I was on the rostrum, never did I think that we have to delay the May auction in Geneva. By now, Switzerland is sort of doing okay. Um, the new infection numbers are quite conservative. Um, the European Schengen area has opened up and we can actually welcome clients in the auction room. Have to respect, of course, quite a number of rules and regulations, but we're really excited. The exhibition opens in less than 48 hours. Oh, so you've got a lot on your plate. So I appreciate you taking this hour to uh, chat with us. So. It's obviously a really strange time and it's particularly strange for industries or businesses that require or um, rely on physical interaction and interacting with watches is a physical thing. So how have you guys tackled the new normal and how do you see this evolving and impacting the auction industry moving forward? I know that you guys have a lot of online sales, so I think maybe it would be cool for everybody to know um, how you guys are adjusting. We're still in the process of learning how to navigate in this new now. Um, we do a lot of online, but you rightly said, watch collecting is something you want to share with the community. Watch collecting is about the details, and we will speak about the details later on, where you want to touch a watch, try it on, loop it, and as much as I've spent the last three months on Zoom, I don't think all this very nice camaraderie, this sort of help each other community is, is, cannot happen all over Zoom. It's not quite the real deal. So it will probably be a, a combination of um, old fashioned uh, non-technology and modern technology, how we will go forward in the future. I obviously hope the vaccine comes soon and we can go to a real, traditional normal but i don't think this is happening very soon yeah but so you guys do i mean do you anticipate have you been talking to a lot of people over text and i know you mentioned that you had some like zoom collectors one-on-ones and you can kind of schedule those appointments i think that would be really um good to fill people in in case they want to contact you guys after this to, to so see. with our very arthur to show another Thing we have in common in our career. Yeah, Arthur! Hey, <laughs> if you help us, that this, there's no glitch in today. I've been the busiest man on the planet in the last three months. Um, lots of editorials. Um, we have now condition reports for each watch where the watch is filmed. There's a video oh, amazing. in the condition report where the watch goes 360 degrees. Um, we do Zoom previews with clients. We do webinars. I mean, yes, we learn as we move forward and it's proven to be very successful and there's a real appetite um, from, from the collectors around the globe to engage with us via the computer and the mobile phone. Amazing. Well, I think we should, you know, I think people are registered in, so I think we should kind of get started. I, the pr purpose of this webinar for everyone who's here is to really go through all the, not all the lots, but all the highlights from this sale coming up. Um, 
one thing that I remember from my time at Sotheby's is you just learn so much from seeing all these different watches come up. You get these crazy watches with tons of provenance, tons of value, tons of patina, and tons of like little tiny details that really make a difference. And I think as watch enthusiasts will all agree, it's all about the details. Um, so for, for us, for the, just to give everybody a little overview, we're gonna talk about what makes a watch, what makes it important, and why you should pay attention to the little things and how that can improve your collecting and your knowledge of watches. Um, then we'll talk about some day dates that have resurfaced, then there's going to be an independent section and then we'll end on the um the high the main highlights the jcb jean-claude beavers uh collection that is up for auction which are really really wonderful pieces not only from a historical perspective but from a, an ownership perspective as well uh so to kick things off i browsing through the catalog i noticed that there were lots of watches that had little tiny things about that that if you didn't pay close attention to you might not know the difference and you might not know why it was important um, one of them being these two explorer dial submariners uh that i that initially caught my eye you've got the 6200 and the 5513 and if you're new to watches or you don't know anything about vintage rolex you would look at these two and you would say well, why is this one so much more expensive than this one? I don't quite understand. They look exactly the same. So I think it would be great to kind of, if you could walk us through what is the difference and what does make it make this one watch better than the other, not better, but more expensive than the other. Um, and I know one of them has like a really, really awesome backstory. So why don't you kick things off, Aurel? Yes, so the Explorer dial is obviously called Explorer dial because that was the dial design we would find on the first sort of overtony large bubble backs from the early 50s, including the one that um, reputably Sir Edmund Hillary was wearing um, on, on his first ascent to the Mount Everest. And then very early on with the Big Crown Submariner, the 6200, that was really the first professional diver's watch as it was waterproof to 200 meters. The previous generations were at 50 or 100 meters, more recreational diving. And the 6200 was blessed with this amazing 369 Explorer dial. So cool. They made probably just over 100 examples, so definitely far away from industrialized mass production. Mm -hmm. Many were used in the harshest of all environments. Um, polished, scratched, maybe some fell off the wrist and fell into the sea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and this very watch here, believe it or not, was discovered at a flea market dash zook in Egypt not so long ago. That is so wild. It's so unusual to hear that people find these things. It's, like worth, that looking it's, like such... it's oh. worth looking for treasures. I can tell you there are still treasures out there. And no. <laughs> the way the watch was found was in this very condition. This, the, the crystal was very opaque. You could hardly see through, the, the, you couldn't assess the dial quality. The black bezel insert was missing, mm. but very strong bevels, great original sharp crown. And when the watch came to us, the first thing, obviously we, we looked at the dial and I can tell you the dial is really unrestored. And that already is an amazing discovery, just a dial. Case, as you can see, very strong. Um, still the original loom on the dial, beautiful beige color. And, and we, we, we saw what it should look like, um, and then available to the successful buyer of the watch, we sourced the correct 6200 bezel that is available, but not included in the lot. So you don't have to buy just half a Submariner. You can buy, if you wish, a complete 6200 in unrestored condition. And that so, is pretty much so, the holy grail of all Submariners, the first generation uh, Big Crown. So I have a question. So I have a question. Oh, there's a little back noise. Can you guys hear that? That's all good. Um, so why would you guys sell, like, first of all, this is the second watch you guys sold out of bezel. So I feel like you guys kind of like this trend. It's like very, with the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the uh, what was it, the Marlon Brando watch. Um, but so why would you make a decision? So I think it's great that you guys are including the bezel. Obviously, I think that's very helpful for the buyer. But how do you, it, is it to keep the integrity of the way that it was found? That is that why you guys sell it without the bezel? Because you want it to be in original condition? 
Uh, absolutely. Um, I don't want to pretend it was found with a bezel when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had in the past clients on the phone who said, well, I would have bought it if I only knew where to find the bezel. Right. So we've done the job for you. There is no obligation to purchase the bezel that comes at an extra cost. And <laughs> let me tell you, a rare, an original 6200 bezel um, <laughs> has its price tag. <laughs> but it's clearly the service to both the seller, both the buyer. This is what Philips can do for you. Take it or leave it. Um, but in the past, whenever we had watches offered without bezels, buyers always wanted the bezel on top so right. they have a complete watch. Yeah. No, I, I think it's cool without the bezel. I, I would wear it with, I would wear it without, but that's just me. Um, and so with the 5513, obviously it's also an Explorer dial Submariner, um, but a very different one. So maybe you can walk us through why these two are, are, are just so different, even though they look very so similar. So the 5513 is also waterproof to 200 meters. It's obviously already two or three generations after the 6200. After the 6200, we had the 6538, the real James Bond reference, then the 5510 for a very short period of time. And then as of 1960, we see the Submariner come to the market for the first time with the Crown Guards those shoulders left and right, top or bottom of the crown to protect it against impact or inadvertently uh, unscrewing the crown. And very early on, when they were still making those gilt dials, the Submariners were only in specific markets available with that Explorer design, notably in Great Britain. And this here is really an interesting example because it is from the transitional year when Rolex stopped using radium and went to new luminescent compounds, notably tritium. You still have the old dial plaque that says Swiss at the bottom, so there's no T yet of any kind, but underneath Submariner you see the underline. So it is an underline dial mm -hmm. and that underline we understand was used only in 63 to designate watches that already were healthy, shall I say, and ready to be shipped uh, abroad. Very, very few of these in original condition in the last 25 years on the market. So it is a very, very attractive uh, and, and definitely worthy of, of any uh, sports watch collection. And yes, at first sight, very similar, but if you look at the details, completely different. Yeah. How do you feel about radium dials personally? I know some collectors don't like to wear them. Do you, do you wear any radium dial watches? Um, I don't have a problem myself. First of all, I change my watches every day. I cannot stand wearing a watch for more than 24 hours. So that's already, I think, pretty much preempting any concerns. And then um, if you knew how much red meat I eat, how much red wine <laughs> I drink and other unhealthy things I do in life, I don't think the watch will be what kills me one day. The radium is the least of your concerns. <laughs> the least of all, I can tell you that, yes. <laughs> um, all right, well, moving on to the next, we have this really amazing Omega that is, upon first sight, looks just like a standard Calatrava, but it's actually not. It's big, uh, which, if you think about for the year that this is produced, is really, really remarkable, and it's really hard to find, or not hard to find, but it's unusual to come across these watches from this time period that were so big because it was the trend to have smaller watches then. So... This is 44 millimeters. This is big. This is like a modern Panerai, as you said on our previous conversations. Like what, what is the deal with this watch? It's amazing. So I'm glad you picked that watch um, for today's uh, webinar. Why? It's very difficult for us to illustrate in a catalog how big it is in real, because just looking at it against a beautiful blue black drop, um, backdrop, you would just think it's a nice 35 plus minus Calatrava. And sometimes when uh, our collectors and even some of the most experienced dealers flip through the catalog, they literally flip through the catalog. They don't read the small print. And there is so much information. I always encourage all collectors, curious amateurs, please read the small print. There's so much great information. And you wouldn't believe it, it is 44 millimeters. The watch is bigger than a Portuguese, vintage Portuguese. Similar period of time, it was in the 30s, but the Portuguese was done in steel. So think of Portuguese size in gold. Yeah, it's amazing. We know three examples of this very type. 
the three have very similar and very close serial numbers, both Moodle and Case. And all of them were delivered in the same year, 1939, to Poland. So I think there's also a fantastic, fascination, uh, fascinating uh, historical element. Think Poland, 1939, where the world was. Yeah. Who did the order? We don't know. But 44 millimeters round, but still thin, um, three pieces known is an amazing, amazing watch. And this is fresh to the market. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, at 39, it's like right when World War II was kicking off. So it, it's interesting to, to think about that time. And when you look at it, if you guys can see on the slide with between the two pictures, you've got the 96 below, tiny. Well, let me show Not you Not tiny in real life, but when it's compared to the other one, it's so small. So, oh yeah, uh, there you go. <laughs> there we go. This is the World Time 96 from the Jean-Claude Biver collection. It's a nice 30 millimeter watch, which back then in the late 30s was a proper gen size. And now, sort of, now you can do the sort of Steven Spielberg yeah. Jaws music. Dum, 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 dum. <laughs> Look at that. And it's I put them insane. really side by side. It's the same level. It's not that one is closer than the other. Now they're touching each other here and look at the size difference. Yeah. And it reminds me of that. Um, it reminds me of this like black dial paddock and the reference escapes me that I think it was like 46 millimeters that we sold at Sotheby's, I think. Do you remember that one? Yeah, absolutely. The one that inspired the 5070 chronograph. Yes. Amazing. I mean, it's just like the when you see them in person, you just can't get over like how big they are. Because yeah. they're so flat too. It's not like, you know, when you see the modern watches at 44 millimeters, a lot of them are thicker and there's more bezel and it just kind of doesn't, it, it just, the way that it wears is so big. Exactly. It's so thin. It's just really it's crazy. Wonderful anyway, beautiful watch. And the fact that it's like fresh to market is awesome. Um, but another thing you were talking about small print, and that's another thing we want to get into is no reserve lots. What is a no reserve lot, Aurel? What does it mean? Okay. And why no should reserve. we care? <laughs> So you should pay attention when it says no reserve in the catalog and many people don't read catalog. So I encourage everyone to read all the small print means the watch will be sold regardless of what the highest bid is. It could be $1. It could be a thousand dollars. It means it goes to the highest bidder. There's no reserve price. The seller basically gave us the watch and said, okay, look, I don't need it anymore. I trust you. I trust that the market will do justice. I want to move on. And I personally don't think it's a wrong decision that when you have especially a pretty minty 5396 mm. rose gold with a blue dial, it's, it's, it's a very, it's maybe radical for the seller, but um, it's, it's a good way to, to, to move on. Yeah. Well, something I've noticed with no reserve lots is it actually ends up selling really well because it creates a lot of interest and a lot of people think that they can kind of get in at a, at a lower price but it i mean it depends on the watch obviously if it's if the condition's not great or it's not something that's super popular but Look, it's very uh, simple whether it makes below the estimate or above sending in a bit and making sure nobody gets it for less than what you're willing to pay doesn't have a cost um, you're not missing out you shouldn't be intimidated you don't have to do a down payment or anything Try your luck. And I've seen it happen that one in 10, no reserve watches, the hammer comes down and people say, sorry, sorry I was so little, why? So yeah, uh, I totally think it's terrible. a great uh, sort of like a little bit of pepperoncino on a nice dish. It yeah. spices up uh, an auction. Yeah. And just to give some people a little background, if they're not sure what a reserve is, um, the reserve is the price at which the watch cannot sell below, correct? With the correct. So the seller says, oh, I don't want to make less than this. This is what I want to make. So you set, so you set the reserve at that number. So when there's no reserve, there's no minimum. So it can sell from zero to infinity, whatever, whatever it ends up um, auctioning for. Um, so in addition to no reserves, we got it. Rarity is a really a, bi a big thing with the details. Um, when something is rare, it's like so. It's such a, a word that we use all the time, and it's like, oh, this is rare. This is rare. This is rare. This is rare. Uh, but sometimes things are really rare. Um, and I would actually think that this Omega is a really good example of that, the 2998, um, especially with the color of the dial and everything. So why don't you walk us through, through this beautiful watch? 
the 2998, um, sort of second generation Speedmaster, still with those straight legs, not yet with the so-called Lira Lux. And this is the very first generation, the Dash 1 from 1959. And inevitably, you cannot but be amazed about the caramel brown, chocolate brown tropical dial. It's really, really amazing. And upon researching the watch, you open the case back and you find out that the movement is ending with zero, zero, zero. It's quite unusual that you get a triple zero. We checked with the Omega archives. They're not sure to be able to say this is the very first one they ever made, but didn't exclude it. But what we do know is that until today, according to Omega scholars, this is the lowest serial number on any 2998 ever surfaced in public. So there is a bit of a story, uh, definitely lots of looks. You still got the original dot over 90 bezel. Um, yes, the loom on the hands has fallen out over the years. Yeah. It's an awesome looking watch so with cool. that potential of being sort of the ancestor of all 2998s. Amazing. Love that. I know there are a lot of Omega lovers out there, so people I'm sure will be really thrilled to see this one go. Um, the next one we want to talk about was this AP, which I have my AP on today. I just realized it's kind of the new version of this Good. one. Um, super hot watch. People love it. People talk about it. When it first came out, no one liked it, but now everybody loves it. Here we are. We've got this watch, which is really unusual because there's no serial number, which at first, you would probably be like, oh, that's really weird. Like, maybe don't want this one. But then you, <laughs> then you talk to AP, and it turns out that this thing is like a pretty amazing transitional piece. So um, that was exactly our reaction. Um, and when you see a Royal Oak with no number on the back, you think there must be something wrong. It's either been polished <laughs> or just next to serial number. There was a monogram that was taken out. So we checked the thickness of the case back. It wasn't thinner than what it should be and checked with Audemar Piguet. There is a letter from Audemars confirming that they did this very watch without a serial number. It's not 100% sure why, because many of the witnesses from back early 70s, the AP managers are no longer with us to mm -hmm. tell us the story. But it seems that at the end of the A series, the sort of mythical Adam and Eve moment in Royal Oak history, they continued making the Royal Oak and thought, as of now, we don't need to number them anymore. Right. And only after some, maybe maximum 100 watches, they moved on to the so-called B series. So this very watch here that dates to 1975 is right in the middle between the A and the B series, when for a couple of weeks, probably, they did not number the jumbo Royal Oaks, the famous reference 5402. So we, and I didn't know that existed. We learn all the time. You always start with a good portion of paranoia saying it's got to be wrong. It's got to be wrong. And then we prove or try to prove the innocence and show that everything is correct. And once this is done, it gets into the catalog. Yeah, that's a really cool. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen one of those before without the serial number. So it's really interesting. So I guess it, yeah, it, so admit, it's made it's in 75. So it's transitional because then B started around 76. So it's just really really need to see these kind of pieces come up and this is why auctions are what they are and you, you guys always find like the most interesting stuff so it's great to great to see um and the next watch we have is about provenance which we will talk more about provenance later with jcb's watches but this one is a super cool spy provenance which i i have a hunch people will be really into so it's a watch that no one knew in the public arena before it was um published here in the catalog. It's a regular day just from the early 60s in yellow gold with a yellow gold Jubilee bracelet. It was consigned directly by the family of the late um, Agent Powers. Mm. He may not have been known to everyone um, who's not a history or Cold War buff, but we've all seen the famous Steven Spielberg movie, uh, Bridge of Spies, um, featuring also Tom Hanks where in fact in Berlin they've exchanged spies, the Soviet Union and the US. So Agent Powers was flying with the U-2 aircraft over Soviet space. They thought flying at 60, 70, 80,000 feet, I can't remember the exact number, that they would be way out of sight and radars of the Soviet um, air uh, space control. 
wrong they were. He got shot down, um, wasn't killed, thankfully. Yeah. But um, he, with a parachute, landed on Soviet soil, was captured. Uh, they also uh, collected the debris of the aircraft. That was, a, technologically uh, speaking, a disaster for the U.S. He was put up a trial in Moscow. And only afterwards, once he was sentenced uh, for, for, for illegal activities in the Soviet Union, thanks to that trade, he was able to return to the U.S. back home. And we were told by his son that the, one of the very first things he did with the money he received from the, um, from the CIA, he went to buy a yellow gold Rolex. And we still have it with the original cert, the chronometer certificate, the rating certificate. It's never been on the market. And I can just guess, if you hold the watch close to your ear, maybe it's gonna tell you really amazing Cold War stories from, from past decades. This is what provenance is all about in my view. I love that. How, like, so for, for a watch like this with like box and papers, I mean, how important are the box and papers for a watch like this? This is more about the story. This is more about the ownership. This is more about who had it and the story behind it. But so well, how do you figure in box and papers with this watch and then with other watches as well? Because a lot of people I talk to are very kind of like, Oh, well, it doesn't have box and paper in it. So it, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the first, to me personally, but everyone has their own parameters. To me personally, I first look at the watch itself, its originality, and its condition. Mm -hmm. I cannot deny that a watch in poor condition uh, doesn't appeal to me, um, that such is life. Uh, once you ticked these first boxes, rarity comes into play. Um, it is obviously a nice accessory to have original paperwork, documents, box. It may add 10, 20, 30% to the value of a watch to those who are interested in it. Um, if we look at that day just, I think a regular yellow gold day just from the early 60s is plus minus $10,000. Then you add box and papers and you may climb to twelve to $15,000. And then comes this amazing Cold War Gary Powers provenance into play. And we felt the least we can do is double it. Let me remind you, the Paul Newman, Paul Newman made 170 times its market value. The uh, Marilyn Brando GMT Master, not far away. And here we just doubled it. So I think it's a good package. It's an attractive proposition. Um, it's It's quite difficult because there is no other Gary Powers um, uh, day just out there that we yeah. can compare with and say, oh, the last one did X, so what will this one do? Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, I think that's why everybody kind of gets into watches. It's all about the story behind them and, and, and what ties them to people emotionally and what speaks to you. So I, I don't know, it's a really great watch um, and story. So I think, Aurel, for the sake of time, we might Skip over the day dates, love them, think they're amazing watches. There are, there are several that have kind of reappeared from the glamorous day date sale. So I encourage everybody to go look at them. They're amazing, but they're, I love them. But I wanna get to the independents because I think that independents have really seen a rise in popularity as far as new collectors are concerned when you buy straight from the, the boutique or from the maker. Um, and when I started out in auction, they weren't th there weren't that many. There were just a few here and there that would come up really special pieces, but they were really unusual. And I noticed that in this sale, you guys have a really big handful of them. You've got the Haybring, you have an MBNF, you have a Resence that's unusual, and then you have these two really awesome F FP Jorns that are really significant for the history of his watchmaking. Um, so you have these two subscriptions that are really wonderful and they all have different details and if you're an independence collector which i am full disclosure am not <laughs> um so for if you are though these are kind of like the holy grail for fp journs um so what what are your thoughts on this and how many screws are, are in the tourbillon here oh okay uh thanks for putting me in the hot seat now first of all <laughs> independents are probably the perfect crossover between vintage and contemporary regular contemporary production 
Um, many of the watchmaking techniques, the, the small numbers of watches produced are closer to the vintage world as we know it. But then of course, when it comes to diameters, the um, materials uh, often used, they're much closer to the regular contemporary watches that we can buy on Madison Avenue or on Rudy Rhone. Uh, these two watches are extremely relevant. Um, happy to talk you through. When it comes to the number of screws of the tourbillon and the details, I'm completely um, lost for words, to be very honest. I'm not such a specialist like my colleague Alex Gottby. Um, I feel like in that TV show, what is it called? Um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Yes. Yes, yeah, that in the US, where the candidate can call a friend at home and, and, and ask for help. So if you okay. really want to ask me about the tourbillon, let me uh, see if I can get um, Alex on the phone because um, Alex, hi, wh where are you? Can, you? can you help me? I'm here on the webinar with Kara and I need, uh, I need some help. Can you please jump in? It's about the tourbillons, the FP Jordans. This is your speciality. Can you? I hope it's free. Yeah, uh, I need him. I need him right now. Can you help us, Alex? Oh! Hey. He's here! <laughs> Surprise everybody! Thank you, Alex. <laughs> joining it's about us. about your speciality, the independence and the subscriptions uh, from Lawrence Boimer. Please help me out here. Ooh, I'm glad you were free, Alex. Walk well, us through. Tell us, tell us what you know. Well, this was unexpected. Well, well thank you. And uh, Cara, hi. Thank you hi. for having me. Welcome. Uh, good to be with the, the Houdinki, uh, Houdinki team and the, the, the viewers. Happy so, to have you. Uh, thank you. So, you want me to talk to you about the, the two fantastic and rare Jaune subscriptions that we have in our, in our sale. Yes, I hear you're the expert. You know all there is to know about these two incredible pieces. That's uh, us being too kind, but I, I do have a soft spot for, uh, for independent watchmaking. <laughs> so, I, I, as you know, I mean, Jaune is probably today amongst the better known living independent watchmakers. Uh, and he's only been around for, I mean, he's only had his brand for 20 years, which is, which is nothing. Yeah. Uh, he started off as a watch restorer and he made some one-off pieces for some, some private clients. And in the end of the 90s, he wanted to create uh, a brand and make watches in series. And he needed funding to, uh, to be able to buy the tooling, et cetera, and, 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 and the products. So he did what Breguet did before him was a subscription system where clients would pay up front a special amount, which would be less than the, uh, the watch's retail price and have access to a um, limited series. So he did this uh, first with uh, a tourbillon. His first pocket watch was a tourbillon. His first wristwatch, pièce unique, well, he had made three of those, uh, was a tourbillon. So he decided that his first series watch would be a tourbillon with a remontoir. And uh, so he contacted 20 clients who paid up front. And uh, about a year later, he delivered his, uh, his first tourbillon. And here we have number 14 out of only 20 made. So the watch belongs, uh, is consigned by Lawrence Baumer, who's a, a jeweler in Paris. Uh, he's Austrian slash American, also an independent. He's better known for having done the the jewels for uh, Princess Charlene's wedding with uh, Prince Albert of Monaco. Yeah. So Lawrence Bomer paid up for this watch sight unseen just out of friendship for, uh, for Jorn and for his interest in, in uh, mechanical watchmaking. And the second really interesting Jorn we have is the resonance subscription. Mm. Basically, Jorn, once he sold his first 20, had a second idea for a, for a resonance system, which had only been seen in pocket watches and uh, pendulums, and he had miniaturized everything in a, in a wristwatch format. Same, he uh, offered uh, the watch to the first, to the 20 who had bought the tourbillons, and according to Jorn, he's not sure of how many he made, but he thinks between 16 and 17. So three to four uh, tourbillon owners did not wish to purchase uh, a resonance. Now here was really amazing, other than it's a mechanically amazing piece, is that it has a platinum and a pink gold case, whereas all the others 
or platinum with a yellow gold. Yeah. Two of these are known in this combination. And it was an idea of Lawrence Baumer. He's a jeweler. He wanted something, something special. So here we have it. Number 14 as well. Two known in this combination. And both watches are actually a real piece of horological history because before Jorn, there was no resonance wristwatch and there was no tourbillon with a remontoire, which everybody, and today other brands have done it, yeah. but he was the first. It's amazing. Um, so you're saying there's only two of all FP Jorns that are made in platinum and rose gold or just out of this series? Out of this series, I'm, we're not aware of any other ones, at least in yeah. resonance. Uh, but in the resonance, the subscriptions, there's only these two. And where do you see the future of independence at auction? Like these are clearly really impactful pieces and really important for horological history, as well as if you're an, an independent collector. But I know that you guys have been focusing a lot on independence and including them in your auction. So what do you, what do you see for the future of this? Like, what do you think that these watches will um, do at auction, you know, moving forward? Well, as Oel said, there's really is an overlap between independent uh, collectors and vintage collectors, which is originally those that Philips and auction houses in general were, were, were speaking to. I think independence, what's great is you really, each piece is a piece of DNA from the maker. Mm. Uh, here on the slide, you can see a resonance. You can see a Harry uh, Winston, a Vianney Halter Opus 3 and a ultra classical Laurent Ferrier. So independence in Globes, different makers, different styles, but each, you know, there's no marketing independence. These guys don't even have marketing budgets. Right. So basically what you see is their blood, sweat, and tears in bringing out what they think is the most amazing and most representative what they do. The watches are rare. They're traditionally made, uh, and they speak to a, to a whole clientele who doesn't actually want to have a watch that everybody else has. Right. Yeah. And, and, and there's more and more and more. I mean, the, the, the interest for independence is, is just increasing uh, drastically. I mean, it's great that the people are opening up to see that there is a different type of watchmaking and a, and a watchmaking which is made for each and every taste. Yeah. Do you find that there's overlap between vintage collectors and independent collectors? Or do you think it's people who are, were vintage collectors and then kind of got a little, you know, seen it all and then they wanted something totally different is i think there's a bit of both but one thing that independent and vintage have in common is obviously the rarity what we were saying at the beginning but also the fact that each watch tells a story vintage watches come with a story i mean oral took us through all these different watches that had something to say independent uh, watches tell a story they tell the story of their maker they tell the story of their epoch uh i mean look at the harry winston opus 3 this, this watch was a game changer for, for its time. There's a before and after. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, watchmaking was just very, very classical. And mm -hmm. after it, people realized that you could actually be technically impressive and aesthetically totally out there. Yeah. And I think it, it, it really opened up a lot, of, uh, a lot of doors, not only for independence, but also for, for mainstream brands to be very creative. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, Max Booster is a good friend and he, his passion is palpable when you talk to him about his pieces. Um, and he's just such a wonderful guy. And then you see his work and it, you can't help but fall in love with it because you know how creative and how inspired he is um, as a person. And so it's really great to see his pieces come up. At, at well, there's one thing, if we have time just about Max Booster and F.P. Jorn, uh, F.P. Jorn did the first Opus series. That's right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I forgot and, about that. And Max Busser launched the Opus series to help Jorn get media recognition. Yeah. So everything at one point today, you know, Jorn is, is, uh, is a main, is, is a family na known name. Uh, but in 2000, when the Opus One came out, he was known by a bunch of, you know, small number of, 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 of collectors. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's funny because I think the watch industry seems so big, but it's actually really small and everybody kind of knows each other and is, overlaps and works together. And it's, it's really, it's something that you don't realize until you're, you're in it to, to kind of see it. Um, so thank you so much, Alex. This was really um, great to talk about. And I think it, we would be remiss if we didn't. Um, and I know, I think Arel has an independent on his wrist right now that he was showing me earlier. I don't know if he wants to show it off, but 
Um, no problem, no problem. I'm, I'm a little bit more conservative. I'm wearing today my Laurent Ferrier that um, started off as a little uh, bet that I've had with um, Laurent um, after the uh, only watch auction. And I said, if I win the bet, I'm granted the opportunity to design a watch myself. And I won the bet. The watch made more than he expected to make. And after like fiddling with designs for a year, this watch um, basically was, was put into production. In the meantime, colleagues like Alex Godby saw the drawings on my desk, said, I want one too, I want one too, <laughs> and again, we made 12. Um, I like love it, I still it. love it. <laughs> yes, uh, I didn't, I'm still not bored of it. Yeah, that's good, they're beautiful. Alex, what watch are you wearing today? Independent. Um... <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a legacy machine one uh, from uh, from Max Visser as well. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, well, very well represented. I see. <laughs> I'm the oddball out. Um, but thank you so much for joining, Alex. I'm glad you were available to to speak about thank this. You, Alex, for saving I'll, I'll me. you anyway. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Um, okay. So without further ado, I think we should talk about. Jean-Claude Beaver. And a quick note to all the viewers out there, we are gonna have a Q&A at the end of this. So be sure to be typing in your questions in the Q&A box and Arel and I will be sure to answer them. But I think we should, a little drum roll. Jean-Claude Beaver, watch legend, or just legend, period. Um, he is one of the most important and influential people in the watch industry. He's been around forever. If you've ever heard him talk, you can't help but fall in love with him. He is just, a force to be reckoned with um, ever since you know, he started with Blancpain and then Hublot and moving on through all of that. He's also a vintage watch guy. He collects vintage watches and we did the talking watches with him um, in 2015. And he has some really, really incredible stuff. And it's so exciting to see four of them come up. Uh, and I know that they were on a world tour last year and um, now they're finally here and available for people. So we've got the 1518 in rose gold, we've got the 96 HU, we've got the 2499 and the 1579, all of which are impactful watches on their own. They are icons of Paddock and now they're owned by an icon and they're going up for sale. So Arel, how awesome is this? Were you so excited to get this consignment? Um, of course I was excited. Um, when you introduce Jean-Claude Biver, um, I'd like to say one uh, thing in particular. He is an incredible friend and even more so an incredible mentor to anyone in our industry. He loves sharing his knowledge and I can tell you many tough decisions in my own business life and my career. He was there to give me advice from obviously a generation ahead of me, um, his experience, his business uh, acumen. So uh, he, he is an amazing man. Yeah. Uh, now, Jean-Claude Biver, as you know, he's an extremely emotional man, uh, very impulsive. Um, he has an incredible instinct when it comes to opportunities. And he started collecting vintage watches over 10 years ago and naturally wanted to buy the most relevant complications by the most relevant and most pre prestigious house uh, Patek Philippe and therefore it is normal to find these stellar references that we're going to discuss. Uh, many have asked me why is he actually selling them? Does he need money? What's wrong? Or he doesn't believe in the market? I just said it. Mr. Beaver, none of it is true, is very fast, much faster than many um, uh, collectors half his age in discovering new things. He discovered independence. He discovered Rolex sports watches. He goes to niche brands. He's now collecting a small Zenith El Primero here. When he bonds with a maker, meets the maker, hears the story, he expands and he moves on. Same with wine, art, the way he dresses. Um, and that's why it's a natural evolution for him to part occasionally um, with, with a few pieces. So the four pieces we have here are watches that he bought some 10 to 12 years ago at auction. Uh, the first one is the pink on pink 1518. Gorgeous. That is gorgeous. Now, you know, less than 300 watches made, the world's first perpetual calendar chronograph made by any manufacturer in series. The vast majority in yellow gold, 
very few in pink gold. And then, of course, there's the mythical unicorn steel 1518. You mentioned it earlier, $11 million later in 2016. And the owner I know has already received offers in excess of that. So the second highest sort of grading and exclusivity in the 1518 world is a pink example with a pink dial. Mm -hmm. That watch, when it came to the market 10 years ago, came from the original owner's family, meaning since circa 1950, for 60 years, it did not leave the very house. I'm told they never traveled with it, so the watch never left Geneva. It's a Geneva family who owned it. The monogram of the original owner is still on the back, mm -hmm. and the watch was a gift by his beloved wife uh, for the holidays, late 49. That's a very nice gift. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I'm told also because he didn't have the best of all eyesights that he wanted dark blue foy hands instead of the pink gold hands that normally come on a pink and pink 1518. So it is special in many ways. The condition is absolutely to die for. I mean, please have a look at the left picture. You see the hallmark yes, yes. left to the lower left lug and the one at sort of the 10 o'clock position at most a service or two and at most if at all a polish so great quality super rare two owners since new i can assure you jean claude biver admired the watch for the last 10 years but never did anything to it this is as good as it gets it's amazing. Do you still get like, I get like kind of like butterflies when I hear that it's like one family owner and then you look at the hallmarks and then you kind of hear it just these types of watches when you hear those stories, it just, well, it's just so exciting. As I, I, it over <laughs> the first time, I can tell you it was a fierce battle against, um, back then it was a Christie's and um, uh, we were competing against Sotheby's to win this watch. Uh, I was so over the moon when I secured it. It flew and back then fetched a record for any gold 1518 yeah. uh, testimony to its quality. And so far, the response has been very, very good. Um, and I can just wholeheartedly, if you've got some $2 million lying around at home, hello, um, people listening in, <laughs> this is a good watch to buy, believe me. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It's so, oh, these watches never cease to amaze. Um, and then you've got the 96 World Time, which is also impressive. Um, and yeah, incredibly it's, it's definitely impressive when it comes to its historical relevance. Um, it was in the 1930s when Patek Philippe reached out to the independent, hello, independent, uh, Louis Cotier, watchmaker in Carouge, specializing in niche bespoke complications um, and his signature complication is the world time mechanism. This is the very, very first generation of world time mechanism. The second one would be where you have on the reference 1415 or on the pocket watch 605, the revolving bezel where manually with your hands, you turn it. And the third uh, generation would be with the second crown at nine o'clock, known mostly in the reference 2523. And of this reference 96, we only know two examples. The other one can be seen and admired in the Patek Philippe Museum. And the other one here is the only example in private hands. Doesn't even have a signature on the dial, meaning definitely low key. Look at the hand design. That's a design that Mr. Cotier himself uh, designed, um, not used on any other time only watch by Patek Philippe. Another detail for the history buffs, uh, London and Paris in the same time zone. So please go to Wikipedia and read why that is. Um, it's a piece of history at its best. It's amazing. Well, and I think something interesting that people might not know about the Knights, the 96 was the first referenced wristwatch made by Paddock. And they don't, it's usually just time only. You don't really see it with uh, different complications. And so you've got your world time here and it's just really, really unusual to see something like this in that case design. Um, paddock. Can't, can't go wrong. Can't beat them. Um, speaking of next paddock, we've got the 2499 second series. Yeah, um, the 2499 second series is, I think if you had to reduce your wristwatch collection to one watch and want to satisfy all your senses, that's the watch that would probably tick every box. Perpetual calendar chronograph, 
following the 1518 with those sloped stepped locks that if you think about it, Kara, 3970, 5970, 5270. Uh, this is the DNA. Then of course, also with the minute repeaters, the 3974. This is the DNA at its best since 65 or 70 years at Patek Philippe. Puncture in its design than a 1518, it grew by a notable two and a half millimeters. Now we're talking more than 37 millimeters. It's definitely heftier in its appearance, more self-confident. Um, sort of this Calatrava design from the 1518 was probably a reminiscence of pre-war design, uh, 130 chronographs notably. And we see with the second series for the first time, the faceted baton markers and those you know, very self-confident, faceted Dauphine hands. Yeah. Uh, this watch here is in yellow gold, mid 50s. I just put it into a context of how uh, exuberant and lavish motor cars suddenly were with those long fins. Everything was like party, party, rock and roll. And that watch, high grand complication. We hardly know over a dozen of these second series with this type mm -hmm. of dial. And here on the left, look at the hallmarks. Mm -hmm. It is I, I don't know of a better and a crisper example. I wouldn't say it's the one and only in that condition. Probably I know one or two more of that condition, but this is as good as it gets. It does everything a high-end wristwatch has to deliver. Yeah, and I think something so interesting about the 2499 is how modern it looks. It's like very contemporary. Like it feels like it could have been designed yesterday. And it's, it, it's really just a remarkable piece. And I agree with you. It's definitely, it set the tone for what the next generations of watches would look like from Paddock. Yeah. Um, and I think it was only, it was start, it was launched 10 years after the 1518. Yep. The first so series. It's really interesting in, to think uh, about them side by side that way. And it had the, the fifth, the, the first generation still had the square pushers. Yeah. It was smaller and uh, had still the Arabic numerals. Uh, that again, a sort of slightly more subtle reminiscence of the 1518. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's cool when you think about them side by side and how they evolved and how different they look. Um, and then finally, we have this 1579, which has a crazy case shape with the spider lugs, um, really unusual, but also not unusual for Paddock. They were always doing cool things with their cases and trying to come up with new designs, especially around yeah, that the time. The 1579 is, is um, the Ancieraño, the spider lug chronograph large in size, um, but quite amazingly, and we don't know why, they made three of them, only three in platinum, consecutively numbered. Yeah. And until the introduction of the 5070, half a century later in platinum, there were no other platinum chronographs. There's no 1463 Tasti Tondi, there's no 530. So why right after World War II, three chronographs in platinum? Also amazing, the three of them are all fitted with different dials. The tachometer design is different with the three watches. So why bother making three pieces to begin with? And then why making three pieces with three different dial designs? And this one here, and you can see it beautiful on the, beautifully on the picture on the right, the inner fifth of a second scale is in ink blue, blue yeah. enamel. Something I've never seen on any other chronograph reference. So you've got something probably a little more intellectual and less ostentatious than a 2499, but a super holy grail for the watch collectors because it's one of three platinum vintage chronographs that we know of made by Patek Philippe. Do you think they were made special order? Like there were just three people that wanted them and then they made them? Or do you think they started making them and realized that they didn't want to make them anymore? We, we tried to find out and as far as I remember, and I would have to dig and check my notes, um, the three watches do not have the same date of sale. Huh, okay. So if one person ordered three, wouldn't he pick them up at the same time? Yeah. I rather think Patek Philippe thought, well, now that the war is over, we can go a little costlier again, made three, figured out that chronographs and platinum don't quite go together and sold them off to three different individuals. Yeah. It's my theory, but um, I don't think one order with three pieces was the reason why they exist. Yeah. 
And so just to kind of like tie things all together. So these four pieces are, as you, you know, we talked about, they're amazing on their own. And then you have this provenance, how much of the provenance impacts things. And I think that was something that we talked a lot about when you sold the Paul Newman. Um, there was a lot of conversation around that watch, watch's value as a watch and that watch's value as a provenance. Um, this is slightly different. But what, what does provenance mean to you as a, when you can sign watches, when you see things for the first time? Provenance definitely matters. Um, provenance can be Mr. or Mrs. Unknown, who simply owned it for half a century. And we can wholeheartedly say this is a one owner family watch since new. In Jean-Claude Biver's case, let's not forget, in none of the four watches we discussed, he is the original owner. He bought them at public auction, and that isn't as personally to me relevant, and I think to many collectors as relevant, as if you have the very watch that Paul Newman himself since 1969 owned and wore. Having said that, if a man of such vision, of such taste, of such education chose them, and picked them amongst many for their collection worthiness and their condition, I think there is a degree of knighthood that comes with each of those four watches for the man who could afford anything, who saw everything, met everyone, they were good enough to make it into his collection. And I think that's relevant. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, okay, so I think we're gonna move into q a we've run a little bit long so we may go over an hour so thanks for everyone for sticking around we're going to get your questions right now so arel are you ready for your question? totally okay go. so charlie d wants to know arel i'm curious to hear what watch books are important to you <laughs> well charlie very good question um thank you for um, being with us even though if we run um uh, beyond our, our schedule. Um, well, here, look, I'm, I'm gonna do something I shouldn't be doing. Oh yeah, there this you go. Is, this is 10% of our office library. You can never have enough watch books. Now, to be honest, it depends what is your passion. Are you an Omega nerd? Do you wanna learn about Patek Philippe? Do you look for a coffee table book that just beautifully decorates your living room and when you have a cup of coffee, you just wanna flip through the pages? Um, a good, Entry, for example, into the world of Rolex is um, the John Goldberger 100 Superlative Chronographs. It's a mixture of technical, aesthetical, historical, nice images. It can go into a shelf, it can go into a coffee table, not rudely priced, and I would recommend that. And of course, also the stainless steel Patek Philippe book, but that's a niche. It's Patek Philippe and only in steel. You've got great books on Omega, great books on um, many other brands, uh, if you wish. Um, I mean, of course, Hodinkee retails a lot of them. Happy to help you if you want more or if you need more specific advice. Awesome. Um, I agree. I think the Steel Paddock book is amazing. Um, so, so someone, Rick L. wants to know, how does Philip screen out dials that have been artificially baked to get the tropical look? Do you guys ever run into that issue or is it just your eye is just super sharp so you can tell? No, um, eyes are just eyes and like look quickly. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Is not good enough. Um, we take out, first of all, every single dial um, from the case because you catch some of the baked dials when you unmount them. You look front and back. Uh, sometimes you see that underneath the bezel, if it's baked, it threw out the same color. If it is natural tropical underneath the bezel, because the bezel covered it from uh, UV rays and, and sunlight, <laughs> Cara is nodding. Yeah, Thank I'm you, like, Cara. oh, yep, I see what you're talking about. <laughs> um, with the toners, with the sunk, or with um, Speedmasters, um, with, with anything that has a sunk subsidiary dial, again, there are techniques how to make it tropical, not tropical, where it sinks into the dial. You look at the back, um, you look at the overall condition of the watch, a watch that is brand new, but the dial looks like it's been, you know, around the world five times. You, 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 and then 
I have to admit, we don't know everything and we often call in the, the real nerds once uh, as every uh, couple of weeks, John Goldberger, AKA Aura Montanari comes to Geneva and points out that something, we check in with Pucci Papaleo. It's, it's a research that often involves 10 or more specialists until we feel we got it right and we can wholeheartedly stand behind the watch. Love that. How does it feel to auction very rare watches, in particular the Paul Newman's, Paul Newman? You've auctioned a lot of record breakers, but I, I imagine there's a lot of, there's a, a, a quiet emotional part that goes into it. So how does it feel? Um, it's, it's adrenaline pure. Um, it's like a roller coaster. When you go up, you think your stomach goes up here, and then you go down and it goes down again. You sweat, you're cold, you're hot. You don't eat in the days before. Uh, some need it, and, and apparently I'm one of those adrenaline junkies that, uh, who need it. It's for those who like that excitement, um, it's, it's one of the most amazing things you can do. Um, and I am sure to others it's intimidating. But the minute, and I promise that to many friends and clients, the minute I'm no longer excited, I will stop auctioneering. Because if that becomes routine and you become blasé about it, just another million dollar watch, better stop it. Yeah. I would like to make also a note, a personal note, that Aurel is one of the most amazing auctioneers to watch. So if you guys have not ever watched him auction, be the auctioneer, you really should go back and watch old videos because it's an insane art form that he has mastered. So I, I just want to say You're that. You're very kind, uh, Cara. <laughs> but uh, yes, this is um, absolutely free of charge. Tune in Saturday, 2 p.m. CET, philips.com. Um, I'm sure it's somewhere at the bottom. It yeah, we'll remind you. Yeah, but the, yes. But so, um, you, you don't have to send in credit card details or, or pledge uh, to sell your collection with us. Watching is free. It's amazing. Um, and then, okay, so we will go. Um, are there any other big figures in the Swiss, Swiss watch industry that have similar collections to JCB on that level that you can talk about? that I can talk about, um, that I can talk about Swiss. Did you say Swiss? Yeah, it's, it's in a Swiss, I'm Swiss, but I would imagine just in the watch industry as a whole, um, we'll broaden, broaden it a little bit because that's pretty difficult to answer. The, the, the beautiful thing is that um, Jean-Claude Biver's collection is as varied as, and, and multifaceted as he is as a person. He's not just like this kind of black and white man in a box. And his collection goes from uh, independence to sports watches to diamond encrusted watches. He uh, recently we saw him with a rainbow. Um, I think I've that's seen what him he post that. <laughs> yeah. uh, now he loves his uh, made to measure modern contemporary Patek Philippe's. And I don't think there is a collection that um, I know, especially here in Switzerland, that is as authentic himself as the man who put the collection together. It is 100% Jean-Claude Biver. That's amazing. Um, how could someone who loves watches and watch auctions get started in auctions as a career? Any advice? I don't believe there's anywhere in the world a school where you learn to become a watch specialist for an auction house. The market is simply too small to even rent a building to make a school it's not worth it. And um, Cara, you know it as much as I do. I think every specialist, including Darren Schnipper, um, anyone in this industry, we just slipped into this. Mm. One day somebody tips you off and says, hey, they're looking for a junior cataloger. And junior cataloger is already a prestigious role if you really want to start um, in this industry. And you send in your resume that I tell you, when I started in 1995 and I sent in my resume, it was half a page. It said uh, elementary school, high school, no graduation, no professional experience. And uh, back then, of course, I had a few collectors who endorsed me and said, yeah, the kid knows something. I was allowed to go and uh, be interviewed. That's the way it works. And that's how many of us started. Yeah, so no, I had, yeah, I would reach out to the specialist, go to a preview, make friends with um, the people in charge, and prove them what you know. Yeah, no, and show them your appetite. 
you do kind of just fall, you follow it, you have the, the interest and the passion for it, and then you kind of just fall in. I have had a very similar experience as well. Um, someone is asking, what's the right way to start learning about vintage watches and start collecting that are below $1,000, $1,000 given my current savings and income? So how would you advise people who are just getting started? Just getting started in vintage. Um, learn, learn, learn. And I think it's even more important that you learn via other collectors and with watches in your hands. Sometimes I see how people gather information on the internet and there's nothing wrong with the internet, but it's like reading recipes versus actually cooking. Mm -hmm. So try to touch watches. You can touch watches when you visit dealers, you can come to auction previews or make friends with collectors who say, Hey, why don't you come on Saturday evening for a glass of wine and I'll show you a box of watches and I'll talk you through them. And I highlight the key highlights of the watch that are relevant and that you should remember. What does an unpolished key case feel like? What does a unrestored dial look like? And how does loom react if it's 50 years old and not redone? So people and watches are the best teachers to start, then books, then internet, then, then, then. Yeah, you, it's like you have to learn peeled potatoes before you can become a chef. Yeah, no, I think that makes perfect sense. Reading, seeing, it's all but you could we, do. As auction houses, our previews are open to the public. Please do come and say to the specialist, hey, I'm Mr. Novice, and can you talk me through five watches? Do you have a moment available? You will be amazed how gracious specialists of any level are to share their knowledge. No, it's true. It's a very open community, I've found. Um, so I think we have time for a couple more. One is, if you could pick one watch from the sale and own personally, what would you pick? Oh, wow. Um, often asked one. question. I often say it's like if you have um, five children who say you can save one, uh, tell me the other four you want to get rid of, impossible. Um, a sale is normally like a family. Um, I, I walk around with the catalog. Um, right now here, well, obviously unlimited budget. Um, I'd like to take any of the four Jean-Claude Beaver watches home. Um, I equally love the, well, just on top of my mind, the Cloisonne uh, IWC Lot 58. I think so much color, so much craftsmanship, so much quality and condition, so rare. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I never ask myself the question uh, because I can't have it all. Um, uh, wouldn't mind uh, any of the two Jorns, wouldn't mind the oversized Omega. Listen, I could probably at the end you say, Aurel, you just mentioned every single watch in the sale, so what's your <laughs> pick? Um, I think when you really love watches, though, it's kind of hard. <laughs> like each one has a different, a different purpose and a different meaning. So I, I can see how. Yeah, that the is question cool. should have been asked: Which one would you not want in your next sale? Oh, but I don't think. We, but that's what, what would you say to that? Well, maybe maybe there's something sixty millimeters that I can't wear. <laughs> uh, something colorful for me. Um, <gasps> But yes, I mean, in order to make it into the catalog, I have to stand behind the watch. But it doesn't yes. mean that I would want to wear it every day. Exactly. Very true. And I think the last question should be, um, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of these, but um, what is your advice for new bidders? So if you've never bid at auction before and you find a watch that you like, it can be kind of intimidating. What do you, what do you suggest? Do you suggest reaching out? Like, how do you... I'm, I'm really delighted um, and I'd like to thank uh, this viewer for asking this question because this is a very important question. Uh, as much as I'd like to sell all of you viewers a watch, um, I'd rather not sell it than selling you the wrong watch. And in order to avoid that, preparation is key. Preparation means don't just walk into a sale room. It starts at 2 p.m. and at 1.58 you rush into the room with a paddle and start waving your paddle. Go, you know, catalogs are available uh, four, maybe even five weeks before an auction. So start reading as soon as you can. Don't delay until the last moment. Read the small print, as I mentioned, 
you will discover that that omega isn't 35, but 44 millimeters. Then without further ado, reach out to the specialist in charge, either a specialist in New York or in Hong Kong or in Geneva who can give you advice. They have seen the watch. They have maybe knowledge where the watch came from. There's also a lot of information that we cannot print in the catalog because simply it would become that thick. And start talking comparables, budget, ask for a condition report, do the math in terms of what will it cost me until I have it at home, duty, sparse premium, shipping charges, in order that everything is in line when the bidding starts. You know how far you go, you know how much it will cost you, and you've done your homework. You may not be the winning bidder, but for sure there's no disappointment uh, in, in, in ahead of you if suddenly after the auction you realize that you didn't read the condition report, that you have to first do a service, uh, the shipping is more expensive than you think, do it before. And I can guarantee you, auction house specialists love clients who ask questions before and not after the auction. Um, <laughs> sure. we, we'd like you to come back um, and, and share this passion with you for many, many years. Yeah, great. Well, Arel, thank you so much. This has been really interesting and it's always great to talk to you and talk about what you guys have going on. And it's a really beautiful catalog and everything is interesting, has a great story behind it. Um, and your editorial efforts and all the notes are great. Um, so I think I really encourage everyone to go online or order a catalog if you haven't already. Um, the sale is on the 26th to the 27th, uh, Geneva time. And Aurel will be there. He will be front right. and center. 27, 28. Oh, I wrote it down wrong. Sorry, guys. I did so well until just yeah. now. So 27th to the 28th. <laughs> 27th to the 28th. And Aurel will be there front and center auctioning as always. Um, and it should be a great show and a great, a great auction. So best of luck. And um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This has been awesome. Thanks. Everyone, thank you, Kara, for hosting me. Um, it's been great fun, and I uh, hope to see you all in New York, in Geneva, or in Hong Kong, wherever you are. Good morning, good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kara. See you soon. Bye.